Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sir Conversations by IHS Market. My name is Jim Burkhardt, and the topic of this conversation is the global oil market. And I'm joined by Spencer Dale, the chief economist at uh, BP, and also Saad Rahim, the chief economist at Trafigura. So let's get right into it. And when we're looking at the oil market today, I think some historical context would be would be quite useful. So Spencer, let's start with you. Could you provide us some historical context about you know where we are today? How, how do you think about today in a, in a historical context? Um, I guess point number one is we don't really know. Um, the nature of the shock we're living through is just totally unprecedented. And so the economic models we have to analyze what's going on aren't fit for purpose. Even the data collection that we, our government agencies are using to estimate where we are now aren't fit for purpose. So I think it will be many years to know exactly uh, what's going on at the moment. What we do know is the lockdowns have a huge impact on, on, on GDP. And the IMF have estimated for economies which have been affected by these lockdowns, uh, uh, GDP could fall by an, an order around a third. And so I think it's IHS markets current estimate for global GDP growth in Q2 is the order of a fall of around 25%. These in historical terms, these are just unprecedented relative to um, anything we've seen in peace times. Um, so, you, so relative to anything since World War II, this is totally unprecedented. Most people now are estimating a fall of GDP in an annual sense of a sort of five or 6% number. Just to put that in this historical context, we all lived through the great financial crisis and thought that was just something which is the once in a lifetime thing we led through. The scale of the fall we could see this year is three or four times greater than we saw in the financial crisis. So this is historically unprecedented. And Saad, when you look at the oil market, we heard Spencer talk about the global economy context. What, what about the, the oil market? Help us understand where we are in the, the oil market in a historical context. Sure, I think to pick up uh, a word Spencer used, and it's, it's a word I've been using quite a bit myself, which is really unprecedented, right? Uh, and in economic terms, you can go back maybe to the Great Depression for some of these numbers, but for oil market, you've never seen a halt in movement like this in, in human history, really, right? Um, or at least in modern human history. As Spencer said, you know, even just how we look at oil markets, the data, the, the metrics, uh, the signposts that we rely on, really weren't much of a guidepost. So we ended up really having to look at a whole series of new um, data points, data series on mobility, on movement. Um, you know, so it really kind of brought some things to the fore. Now, as a physical oil player, we were able to see the depth of how quickly this, uh, you know, this was uh, hitting the market you know, right away almost. Um, and to me, what was really the, maybe the defining characteristic of this has been this mismatch in timing between demand, supply, demand, you know, refining runs, upstream production, how the different components of the market have had to catch up with each other. And you're getting now these cycles within this broader cycle. Um, you know, and, and so immediately as demand fell off of a cliff, supply naturally took some time to respond. Uh, and then by the time that started to catch up with the OPEC plus cuts, with the US cuts, you were already starting to see demand start to pick up a bit. Um, and so again, it's been this really interesting sort of uh, mismatch in, in, in timing to see how we go from there. And Saad, when did it first hit you, the, the magnitude of this demand collapse or impending demand collapse? When, when did you first kind of think, wow, this is not just a China story, this is something much bigger? Well, ironically, it was during IP week when we were in, uh, we were in London. And I remember saying, putting a note out before we sort of left uh, to say, look, you know, China, we've seen the sort of the, the, the depth of the hit there. It's been about 20% you know, as far as we could tell, and that seemed to be across most commodities because, you know, we also trade metal. So we were able to see what, what the impact was there. So we could kind of get a gauge there to say, okay, this feels like what, what the, you know, the, the sort of the quantum of the impact. Um, and I said, look, as long as this doesn't really get outside of China, then, then you, you may be looking at okay. And then that was a week where Iran and then Italy and South Korea all really started to pick up. Um, and I think it was really when it started to hit Italy and say, okay, just living in Europe, you, you kind of get that sense to look, these things tend to flow across borders much more easily than people think. Um, and so, you know, saying, okay, this is going to be very hard to stop and immediately saying, look, this is going to lead to a halt of movement. 
which by nature, right, a quarantine is designed to stop economic growth, basically, right? That, that is the whole point of it. And so, you know, for us, we, we were, you know, at first we thought maybe this could be 10 million, maybe more. Um, and immediately we started to say, look, the numbers that we're seeing, the lack of movement that we're seeing is actually going to be far beyond that. Because in order to contain the spread of this virus, it has to be more than that. And that's exactly what we've seen. And this is another, Sipal, this is another example of where our models broke down, because normally we would use GDP as the basis for guessing what's going to happen to oil demand. And the nature of these lockdowns meant those elasticities just blew completely out the window because this was this disproportionately affected oil demand relative to GDP. So just another example of where our normal apparatus just doesn't just doesn't operate at the moment. I think that's an excellent point because for, for me, where I had to sit down and really say, okay, instead of trying to figure out where we're losing demand, I need to go through and figure out where we are still actually seeing demand starting almost with, okay, military, you know, use is still going to be going on. So that's a base load. But beyond that, you know, China is coming back. But beyond that, I'm, tr I'm struggling to try and find demand. So we had come out publicly and sort of said, look, we think this could be 30, maybe 35 million. As Spencer, as you said, we're probably not going to know the actual number for quite some time. But I think that was our key was to say, look, we, we're literally trying to find demand and, and being unable to find it if, if these conditions hold. And that's also another point to bear in mind is we've had this enormous shutdown of the world in Q2, or just go to April, which is like the peak of this shutdown, where huge swathes of the world were shut down and we lost oil demand, who knows, 25, 20 million hours a day, who knows exactly what the right number is. But that does imply that the world was still consuming about 70 million barrels a day of oil. So it's, it's worth remembering that even in this world which is shut down, streets were deserted, um, people were, were kept inside their houses, the world was still consuming, you know, of the order of magnitude of 70, 75 million barrels a day of oil. So we, it's worth remembering that point as well. So let's look at uh, demand now and the, the demand recovery. And uh, one part of my question to you both is, uh, Spencer, you mentioned the, the difficulty of measuring an economy or oil demand in real time. It's very difficult under the best of circumstances. Uh, when you look at demand today and how you think it could, you know, unfold over the next year, what do you what are you looking at? What are the signposts you're considering to map out a, a view of how oil demand could recover or not yeah. over the next yeah, year? Yes, and, and Saab will have strong views on this as well. I guess you can break this down into sort of two parts. One is how much will GDP recover? And secondly, will the intensity, the oil intensity of that GDP be significantly different or not? And on the second one, you can think of reasons in terms of commute, people not commuting, working from home, um, uh, less aviation, which have an impact. My hunch is it's the form of which really matters. It's not the oil intensity of GDP, it's just the level of GDP and how much GDP come back. And, and here, I think there's enormous uncertainty, and I guess my one sort of people, uh, one sort of message for people when they're trying to consume economic forecasts at the moment: ask your economists to tell you things in levels, not in growth rates. I think when growth rates are like this at the moment, look at levels. And so I think a question for G for GDP when you're looking at GDP and for oil is where do you think the level of oil demand, or where do you think the level of GDP next year will be relative to where it was in 20, 2019 pre-COVID? Most of the forecasts, the consensus forecasts, including the IHS market forecast, the consensus one, has that level of GDP by next year being at or slightly above its 2019 level. Okay, now the question is, is that possible in a world where we may have second waves, even if we don't have second waves, in a world of, uh, of social distancing, is it really possible to get back to the same level of output that we were in 2019. The Economist, a week or so ago, their front cover was called the 90% economy. And this is the idea about where the economy could get back to in a world of social distancing. And at one level, you think 90%, that's pretty great. 90%. In a world of social distancing, when big parts of the hospitality sector can't come back, we can get to 90% of what we were. That's amazing. A 90% economy is the Great Depression. The level of GDP in 1931 was 92% of its level in 1929. 
And so that is the Great Depression if we're a 90% economy. And so I think that's the big concern. And that's, I think, is going to dominate, in fact, is going to dominate oil demand and everything else is how much can an economy recover in a world where there's not a vaccine and you're still having to do social distancing? And I think the truthful answer is nobody knows that. And that seems to me the big uncertainty rather than the oil intensity of that GDP. I think we're very much aligned on this. You know, in, in struggling to try and find a way to describe this, you know, I kind of use the, the somewhat convoluted, but, uh, you know, sense of saying, look, this is sort of like an inverted square root, right? You've, you've come from a high level, dropped off, of, you know, very sharply, have come back up, but I think you're going to level off at a level that is below where you started. So I think from an oil demand perspective, we're in that, that upward part of the V, but I don't think it's very high. Right. So it feels like demand is really picking up. But I think to get to Spencer's point, exactly that sort of getting back to 80, 90 percent is still going to be lower than where we started. And I look at the U.S., for example, you're saying, OK, 30 million people call it are out of work right now. Of those four fifths are saying, look, we're on temporary layoffs. Right. Which is by far the highest rate that's ever been, um, you know, which indicates, OK, so, the, you know, four, four out of five people think their, their jobs will come back relatively quickly, even if they've been laid off, not furloughed, but laid off. But that still means you're leaving somewhere like a six million overhang of structural, structurally unemployed people, um, you know, which still puts you basically above where you were at the peak of the last recession. So, you know, to put it in those terms, you're saying, how can we really be coming back to the levels that we really were anytime soon? And I think if we go back a little bit further in history. We say, OK, you know, jet travel after September 11th didn't recover until 2005. Both jet and gasoline demand after the last crisis in 2008 didn't recover until 2015. And those were, in some sense, you know, those, those, were, those were financial crises. Those were not targeted directly at movement. Those weren't, you know, we didn't see the kind of unemployment that we're seeing here. So to me, you know, there, there is going to be sort of a, a, a level that we get to, and then structurally it's going to be hard to move beyond that. One point I would make a little bit longer term, and Spencer would be definitely interested to hear your thoughts on this, but... I wonder if we don't see something like what we saw in the 1990s, which was you had cheap gasoline prices, infrastructure being built, low interest rates, and people really moving out, not just to the suburbs, but the exurbs, right? You saw that reverse in the 2000s as energy prices went up, you built up downtowns, people came back in. But now already you're starting to say people saying, look, I don't want to take public transportation as much. I don't mind commuting for a little while longer. If it means I can get a bit more of space um, and I'm, I'm not in this crowded kind of environment, and again, this is where you will see, you know, mortgage rates being low, infrastructure being built out, that incentive for, for banks to go out and lend, uh, and people maybe potentially moving out, and maybe that helps boost some of that. Now, I do think this will look very different. U.S., um, Europe, China, I think will, will, will look very different. Um, but, you know, I think that that is something maybe a little bit longer term that helps mitigate some of the, some of the, the downward impact. And then one other thing is I think we haven't really talked about emerging markets yet, right? And to me, the places that I'm really concerned about right now, Brazil, India, and Russia, right, in terms of where the cases are going, what the economic activity there looks like. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately, it has a potential to look very, very bad there. And, and that really matters for oil demand. You think about the source of oil demand. You put, put China to one side and you think about the rest of developing Asia. So India and the rest of developing Asia and Africa. That accounts for an enormous part of the growth of oil demand we'd like to see over the next 20 years in gross terms, offsetting the falls we see elsewhere. And so the impact that COVID has on, on, those, on those economies is critical. And those economies, both because of the nature of their health systems and because of their ability of governments to support, use fiscal policy to support them, are far less uh, or far more vulnerable. And so I think that is the, the other big un, unknown uh, here. So can I ask you, in terms of this behavioural thing, do you have a, I have not even sure I know what side the impact is. So I can see on one side, people travel less uh, in terms of aviation, people work from home more, and so commute less. Both of those reduce oil intensity of GDP. On the, on the other hand, um, what we're seeing already in China is people switch, switching away from mass transportation into private vehicles. We're also seeing if people don't go shopping or to restaurants, they get more deliveries uh, at home. And so that's pushing it up. Do you have a sense about either those sort of behavioral things, if you can even sign it at the moment? I think it's easy to see the things which are, which are where, where things are going to be less, but you don't have to think that hard to think where they're going to be more. And so I don't even know what the net of those two is, in, in, even in a science sense. I think that's right. I think that's exactly what we're seeing already happening in China is 
that move away from public transportation. And in fact, what is also though is interesting is when the traffic is picking up and where it's picking up, right? So it is picking up during the week and not so much on the weekend. So we, during the weekdays, you're back up to 90, 100%, but it's on the weekends, you're still substantially lower, saying people may be still self-quarantining a bit or being a bit more careful before they go out. Having said that, auto sales in China in April were up for the first time, I think, in 18 months, right? And so very small, but you know that that was that's a, that's enough to say you know that that maybe is where we are headed, um, you know. And and I go back to the U.S., which still you know largest consumer of oil, uh, and saying, you know, in 2015 when prices fell, 75% of hybrids traded in were traded in not for another hybrid or a sedan, but for an SUV or a light truck. So people going out and buying, you know, and if, if gasoline is a dollar, dollar fifty, you know, like it has been, do people say, all right, maybe then then I'm considering that. So I, I do think there's there are these offsets. And then I think one question, um, which maybe we get into a little bit, you know, the question I do get is, you know, on the back of this, do we see a lot of push towards, you know, sort of more green economy, green new deal, whatever you want to call it. And again, I think regionally will be very different, right? So I think in Europe, you will see some of that um, for sure, because it's already been doing that. That was already the agenda. Um, but, you know, again, somewhere like the US, I, I, I struggle to see that when, when energy prices are so low, just because that it removes a lot of the impetus that you've seen there historically for that. Uh, sorry, I mean, can I, I mean, I, sorry, Jim, that we're taking over your conversation here a bit. I think how the world responds to COVID in terms of climate change is, I think, one of the, the biggest uncertainties and perhaps the most important uncertainty for the future of the energy system over the next uh, 20 years. And there are big forces pushing in both directions here. So in, in, one, in one side, um, there's clearly will be a need for domestic economists to focus on their domestic resilience and restarting their economies. And they're going to be doing that burdened down with high, far higher levels of debt and far higher levels of deficits. And that could quite easily distract people and distract governments and distract societies from pursuing that, the, the, the climate change agenda that the world was on prior to COVID. On the other side, there's arguments pushing in the other direction. I think COVID has reminded all of us about the fragility of the planet and the way we're, we're living in that planet. It's reminded people about the, the nature of global threats and, and the fact that global threats don't recognize national borders. It's also reminded us that actually we should listen to scientists when they flag these threats uh, many, many years in advance. Scientists have been, threat, have been flagging the threat of pandemics for many, many years and not many governments responded to that. And likewise, scientists are making very clearly um, the, the, the danger of climate change. And if, if those other forces dominate, and we can build back better. Um, and so as we're doing these stimulation, as, as the governments are stimulating their economies, if they can do that in a way which encourages a greener, cleaner use of energy, then we can actually use this as a way to accelerate the energy transition. But I don't think that's in the bag. I think those of us who want to achieve that will need to fight for that and make the case for that to make sure that these longer term global factors I still have resonate even in a world where as, 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 as countries quite naturally turn more domestic focus and more short term focus. No, I think that's, that's right. Um, and sorry, Jim, we're again, we're just going to continue here. Uh, it's but, fine. Go ahead. So just, just to play off of that, I mean, I think this is, this is you know, see the unfortunate but nonetheless true sort of remark, you know, that Rahm Emanuel made about not letting a crisis go to waste, right? Where you could see countries come out of this and say, well, you know, what's one way to get the economy going again is, is stimulus and infrastructure and potentially a way to do that is via green infrastructure. You know, you do have a lot of people who may be unemployed who may then can be retrained into the sector. And to be honest, yes, you know, deficits have gone up massively and that is a long-term concern for sure. But negative interest rates, in a sense, are markets telling you, we actually would like you to borrow and spend a bit more, right, than, than you're already doing. We will pay you to borrow. So maybe you see a push on that um, from the renewable energy side. I do struggle to see it happening really in terms of the on-road transport. So while I, while I would say very much so on the kind of the, um, the electricity use and all of that, and certainly I think electrification, 5G, all that will happen in a big way. Again, I think where, where we've seen it is, you know, the sector that has been hit very, very hard is automotive. Do you want to burden it additionally with them saying, okay, well, we're going to increase the requirements and the regulations around this, or do you want 
those to go back to maybe some of the you know their their cash cow vehicles and, and, and go from there. Yes, and, and I guess that's when policies which have encouraged people to trade in their their cars which are ten years old and and buy a new car that can both generate that both generate spending and also can lead to massive efficiency gains. And and I guess just relating this point here. There's lots and lots of focus in Europe about what Europe's doing, and there will be similar in, in the US. But what really matters, the big prize here, is those emerging economies we are talking about. So the emerging economies are badly hit. The real prize in terms of the energy transition is for the rest of the world to, to fund that infrastructure investment and support those economies. So when they are rebuilding, they truly can rebuild better. They can leapfrog some of existing technologies. And those countries which are going to be, which are going to generate all the growth in energy demand going forward, will be generating growth in clean energy rather than in traditional forms of energy. You know, a big question facing the world and certainly the emerging markets, and both of you have highlighted the importance of emerging markets, is the future of globalization, the expansion of international trade and investment. We've enjoyed several decades of the great prosperity at the at the global level. Are we entering a period? Have we entered a period of deglobalization, Spencer? I think um, it's very likely that's to be the case, and I think part of that is you see countries turning inwards at the moment. Health systems tend to be domestic orientated, and you'll see naturally countries worrying about the resilience of their health systems, about how are they who the generation of medicines and uh, personal protective equipment uh, and so on. Supply chains as well, you can see a reshoring of supply chains um, as people worry more about complex just-in-time supply chains. What COVID has done is encourage people to trade off, place more weight on resilience and less on optimization and, and restructuring of supply chains is natural here. The one thing I'd also just put into the mix here is in that world of concerns about um, of, of resilience, many countries around the world may start to worry more about energy security. And so they may well prefer to use mm -hmm. reduced energy rather than energy which um, they import. And the impact of this could be really potentially big. Um, we did something in BP's Energy Outlook a year ago, in last year's Energy Outlook, just saying, well, in a world of less globalization, how could this, what impact this had? We've done this incredibly simple, embarrassingly simple experiment where we said, let's suppose all countries which import energy put a 10% risk premium on the energy they import rather than relative to domestically produced energy. Now, 10% was just made up. It was just to give a sense about the scale. What was, all, what was amazing is just 10% had a huge impact on the patterns of import. So, you know, we compared one scenario with an, if China, and China's imports were down, of oil and gas were down by about a third relative to the other scenario. Oil and gas exports of the US were down, um, of, of exports of oil and gas were down by around two thirds because the market for, for imported oil and gas was drying up. And so essentially what those countries were doing were using more of their domestic energy. So for, in, in terms of China and India, more renewables, but also more coal as well, and also some support for the domestic oil and gas sector. So I think when this deglobalization supply chains, we understand that energy security, and what I was struck by this sort of this little toy experiment was just how 10%, a 10% risk premium could generate really big numbers. I didn't expect that. And, and I think that I sort of was quite, I took that away as a learning and now I'm sort of applying it here and saying, if we do see deglobalization, it could have significant implications, particularly for oil and gas, um, where those kind of those economies, which are the, all the growth engines uh, of energy going forward, a lot tend to have very large import dependency of oil and gas, and they may start to move away from that. That's actually a really interesting way to look at it, right? Because you have many producers, large producers in particular, who've always said, look, you know, we can tell you how many reserves we have, but you have to tell me at what price, right? And because if the price is high enough, then, then I have significantly more reserves than, than what I'm saying. And I think maybe that is true than, than globally. And Jim, to your question, I think we've already, you know, started to see it. I think what will be interesting is, you know, do we get regionalization, right, rather than globalization? So you get supply chains and energy chains in particular moving back. So, you know, U.S., Canada, Mexico, they've been really trying to, you know, strengthen that sort of relationship. And then you've got 
um, Europe as well, and then China certainly reaching out to, to its, you know, kind of uh, with the Belt Road Initiative and things like that as well. So do you really tie this this in? Um, and, and I think that that is that is really the question of where we go from here, because you have seen these now vulnerabilities really emerge, right? Um, and, and I think now the question becomes going forward is really, you know, where does the next wave then of supply come from? If, as Spencer said, you are still, you know, even with the worst, uh, you know, kind of oil crisis in history, you are still needing 70, 80 million barrels a day of, of oil produced. And if we're staying down here at these levels for some time, you're not seeing the new wave of projects coming over time, right? Where does that leave us in, in a couple of years? So let's um, uh, tackle supply, oil supply, or think about supply. You know, going from the 1930s to the 1960s, the Texas Railroad Commission was, the, you know, the de facto global oil market re uh, regulator, if you will. Then we know, you know, OPEC, and then, you know, 2016, we had OPEC plus. When you think about where we are today, where we're, you know, we're experiencing the biggest production cut in history, both government directed and based on economics, is there going to be a supply management effort or mechanism in the months and years ahead? Is it going to be similar to the past, different? Or how, how do you two uh, think about that? Uh, Saad, you, you want to start off with that? Sure, yeah. Um, look, I think, I mean, we have a supply mechanism in place right now, which is OPEC plus and really core OPEC, right? So if we look at the size of the cuts that Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait in particular have put together, right? I mean, you know, again, given the, the, the scale and the scope of the, um, of the demand shock, it wasn't enough initially, but as demand has recovered, you, you've, you know, you've seen that now start to come into play. And we're starting to see inventory draws and the like. Um, but, you know, going forward, I think for them to then have to retain that for some time, I think becomes the interesting question. Because already with prices just back to where we are today, we are already starting to see people turn things on, back on almost as quickly as they turned them off. And you've certainly seen that already in the U.S. shale sector, which is, you know, again, seen, we think probably about a 1.4 million barrel a day drop already, you know, and yet people are still are saying now, well, you know, things we've just turned off a, a couple of weeks ago, we may start to be bringing back on simply because prices have got back to a level where, where we think we can do that. And remember, the, for most of the countries under the OPEC plus G20 agreement, it was really only for two months, right? And then tapering off from there. So a lot of these countries are then going to start to say, you know, Mexico, whoever else, for example, are going to start to say, you know, we've fulfilled our, our commitment, the crisis has passed, and we're going to go back to producing, but not really then doing that math to say, look, in a, you know, 90% market is still one where we're oversupplied for some time, and you have a lot of oil in storage. So to work that off will take us some time. So there needs to be still some form of supply mechanism. What's ironic is, yet again, OPEC plus have handed the U.S. shale producers a lifeline again, because, you know, we have seen a few bankruptcies, but again, not as many as you would have expected or thought given, given the scale of this crisis. And here we are, some of these producers who did look vulnerable already starting to talk about bringing production back. So there, I think there is, you know, there, the, the participants, shall we say, of OPEC plus are likely to feel that there is some need for this going forward. The question, the big question for me will be, what is Russia's role in all of this, right? And how do they view that going? I, I share much of Sars' point. I guess, I guess two or three things. One, one is when you think about the power of OPEC and, and what, how OPEC is designed, the thing it's most perfectly designed to do is respond to temporary demand shocks. If you was a, a, a college professor and you was writing a paper, uh, you was doing an essay, an exam question, you wanted to pick a, a sort of shock, an archetypal shock which OPEC should respond to, it wouldn't be far off COVID this thing about this lockdown which then comes back. And so it was odd initially that this shop was the, the camel, that, the, the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of breaking up of OPEC plus uh, uh, alliances initially, because in some sense, this is the, the right shock, the, the shop where that sort of supply management really um, should work. And I, that sort of, when we think about the compliance going forward, so I guess I, at least I had that in my, my mind. I guess two other things I thought were, that were new coming out of this. One is there was new players involved here in terms of bringing the OPEC together. So there's clearly a much publicized role of the US administration. But also I think there's a very significant role played by, by Fatih Birol and the IEA 
who use their convening powers together with the G20 to bring OPEC together. And I think that role played by Fatih and, and the IEA was very significant in, in this process. And I guess the third thing which, I, which strikes me is, this may sound uh, a bit perverse, but the, one way to think about this is Saudi Arabia's power, uh, they come out even more powerful um, as a result of this in, in the following sense. When they hold spare capacity, the, the nature of the conversation they will often have with, with other OPEC members is, um, we're willing to cut our supply, but only if you're willing to cut yours, with the implicit threat that if you don't, um, we're open the taps and you will lose more than us because we can expand our supply by more. And always underneath that sort of game and that sort of bargain was, really? Could they really open the taps? And, would, and, and would, do they really want to open the taps? And even if they do, could they? Well, in some sense, we know the answer to that now. Um, they, they, they will, under circumstances, open the taps, and they can. And therefore, when they next sit around the table, the nature of that implicit type of bargain would have changed as a result of what we've gone through relative to where we were uh, before. Well, thank you very much, Spencer and Saad, for your insights and for the conversation we had today. That was a real a conversation. Not always easy to do virtually, but we pulled it off. So thank you very much. Some concluding thoughts. Uh, we talked about the future of globalization. That's key for global oil demand. As we've seen with this demand collapse, oil is the lifeblood of globalization. So will we, are we entering a period of deglobalization? Big implications for oil demand. And also, uh, we're seeing today at this early stage of trying to understand the world, what's happened in light of COVID-19, is there are different uh, trends emerging, a different, uh, often, sometimes even contradictory trends. You know, will we see more people commute by cars? Also, will we see more people telecommuting? What's the net impact on oil demand? And when you take that to a higher level, it gets to the question of energy transition. Will the repercussions of COVID-19 accelerate the energy transition or decelerate the energy transition. And as Saad and Spencer alluded to, uh, we may see greater regional differences in this energy transition. So we're seeing globalization being uh, pushed apart towards deglobalization, and we're likely to see the impact on energy transition really depend on each region's response. There may be some regions where it's an accelerated energy transition, other regions uh, less so. So COVID-19 and its aftermath, a more complex uh, world perhaps with greater regional differences. So thank you all very much for joining us on Sarah Week Conversations by IHS Market. Okay, thank you.